Hey, my name is Ryan Postel, co-founder of CoStitch, and in this video, we're going to go over our code and why we do the things that we do with them. Uh, first of all, I want to show you guys the IDs and explain that a little bit. Uh, I'm sure it's been said in many places that it's not good to use IDs in your CSS. It's just not good practice, uh, which is true in many cases because a lot of times it can cause specificity issues and, and make you have to do a bunch of overrides, which also makes your code less maintainable and less uh, editable. Uh, so yeah, in that case, don't do that. But here, we're using IDs for their purpose, which is for their specificity. Uh, we want our section's code to only run for this section. So we use an ID with the name of the section that it is, and we have it appended with a unique ID number uh, that is its position in the database. So this is stitch number 877. That is the order in which it was submitted to the database. So there will not be another stitch with 877 on it. So we can go into code stitch and we can search 877 and we can find that exact stitch. And you'll see it up here in the URL as well so that you can see which stitch number you're on. Uh, that's its unique ID. Uh, and we do this because in... In frameworks, it's it's easier to uh, scope your CSS, to use whatever systems we're using to do it. Uh, but in HTML and CSS, we have to be a little more creative. Uh, so we have to use the tools that we have within HTML and CSS to make these little components out of the code. And the best way to do this is to use the ID for what it's supposed to be used for, which is make it specific. So now we have uh, every section with an ID on it, every stitch will have an ID on it with their number. And this also helps us with our naming conventions because we use maybe 10 to 20 class names in all of Code Stitch. We just reuse them over and over again. And we can do this because all those class names inside of them are scoped to its ID. So I can have uh, a CS card group here and it only applies to the services 877. It's not gonna affect the card group in, let's say, reviews 425, because this only runs with the ID behind it. Because when this compiles, it'll be services 877 CS container, services 877 CS content. And this is how we can make these little components. We tie all of these class names to their unique section ID. And, and that's, that's how we do it. That's, that's the secret sauce behind how Code Stitch works without having to need a framework to manage these classes or having to use the BEM model for class naming with modifiers and these double underscores. And it just makes longer CSS class names. What we did is we simplified it so that we can use class names that are descriptive uh, and, uh, of what they do. So we have uh, the card group here. Every card group, like if it's a review card or a services card, is going to be in a card group uh, CSS class name, like right here. This is a UL, and this is the card group container. Inside the card group, every card is called a CS item, and every link inside of it is called a CS link, and every H3 is a CS H3, and all the text inside of an item or a card is CS item text, just like we have CS text over here for our generic text for the, the website. We have an item specific text here, and that's the idea behind that. And you'll see this everywhere. Every card group in, C in Code Stitch will have this class name here, this class name, it'll have these class names. So that makes our code a lot more uh, easier to edit. Uh, it's easier to know what is where and what is doing what. And you don't have to memorize a, a ton of class names to do what you want to do. Really, you just got to you just gotta know the few class names that we use and where to find them, and, and that's it. Like if we look at um, another reviews card, let's look at some reviews right there. Let's just go to all. When we go to... For this one, this, this is a reviews. We got cards here. So when we get the code and the HTML, again, we see the CS card group. We see the CS item. Uh, we have our CS, we have a CS flex group. 
when you see the flex group, uh, that is when we needed to group these items together so that we can use Flexbox. So let's let's look at the, the picture for this thing. So we have a, a flex group for the picture and the name. So when we look at the image, we have the picture here. Let's open up a preview. We have the picture here and the name. The best way to make this work was to wrap it in a flex box so that we can group them and space them appropriately uh, separate from these guys. And that's what that is, the CS flex group. You'll see that in a couple stitches. Uh, let's go ahead and look at another one and see what these have. Like uh, this is another simple card group. Again, CS card group, CS item. We have an icon, so we call it CS icon. We have another CHS, CSH3. We have a CS item text again. We have a CS name for the name. Again, you've seen this over and over again. And this is the reusability of code stitch. This is, uh, this is the benefit that you get with frameworks because you have these pre-built class names that you reuse over and over again so that when you work with a team, nobody's using a no one's using a dozen class names each, where now in your entire project, you have like four dozen different class names and half of them are targeting the same things. It, it's, it's messy. And that's why a lot of people use frameworks, especially in groups because it gives you a predefined set of class names to use to do things so that the code is easier to maintain within a group of people working on it. That's essentially what we're doing here with CodeStitch. We're taking that framework approach and keeping the class naming simple, easy to understand, and repeatable so that when you're using a CodeStitch for an entire website, you know what the class name should be, you know where to find them in the CSS, and if you add anything, you know what you need to add so that it's consistent across the entire website. And this is what makes Code Stitch work. Uh, it's how we make our little HTML and CSS components by using the ID to uh, keep all of the CSS inside of it specific to only that section that allows us to reuse all of these class names and not have to think of different ones for every single section. Uh, and, and I think that is the real uh, benefit of, of Code Stitch is just the way we planned our code to be reusable like this with just HTML and CSS, without frameworks, without traditional naming conventions. We did our own. Uh, and I, I hope it's easy to understand and follow, and maybe you can adopt it yourself in your own work. Uh, and next, I want to go over the media queries, because that's going to tie in, into that. Uh, you'll notice that all of our media queries are in groups, and we even use a media query for zero rem, which is the mobile code, which is kind of redundant because you can put this code, all, all this code in here, you can just copy and paste this outside of the media query and it'll still work. However, the media query lets us collapse it and it makes it look nice. It's, it, it's a way to organize our CSS a lot easier. So we have these little comment tags to say what the section is. And then we have our mobile, our desktop, and our dark mode media query. We extract all of these styles and put them in media queries so that we can better scan our document and find what we're looking for. So all of our mobile code is gonna have uh, all of the styles, all the values. Basically, if you ever wanna edit a stitch, just go into the mobile side and everything will be there. The next media query up, like tablet or small desktop, that's usually gonna be setting the, uh, the flex boxes for horizontal layouts. It's just changing arrangements. So all of the values and the colors the fonts, the, everything will be set in mobile. And then we just use the later uh, tablets and desktop or large desktop media queries to just change positioning and change um, arrangements. And we pulled out the dark mode media query. It's in its own separate zero rem media query so that we can make sure we can keep it separate from the main uh, code group. That way, when you're editing your code, you don't have to go find the dark mode styles in your mobile or desktop. You just open up your dark mode query and here's your dark mode styles. Edit this here and don't have to worry about it. We're just using a media query for an organizational tool. And that also helps us have the dark mode versions of every stitch. Because every stitch we submit to the database, we submit a regular one with just this code. And then we submit a dark mode one with that code plus the dark mode media query. So that's how we're able to serve up the different 
dark mode and light mode versions for these uh, these stitches. We have a dark mode version made for all of them, but we just don't include the dark mode media query with the light version, and we just add the dark mode media query for the dark mode version. And that's how those work. That's why we use it, because now when we need to make an edit, let's say we need to make an edit to the side by side. Now we can find it here. Oh, great. All right, side by side. It's the reverse. I need to make a change on desktop. Maybe I don't like the positioning that's happening. So I just go in here and make whatever changes I need to make, and we're done. So that's that's why you see our media queries like this. Every time you paste a stitch into your site, just go ahead and collapse your media queries and just scroll up and down your document like this to work when you make your edits. Uh, the next thing I want to get into is using rem versus m versus pixels and when. Uh, in Code Stitch, we use rem everywhere for everything all at once. Uh, the only times we don't use rem is for borders uh, or uh, like elements that are like one pixel wide, like if we're making underlines for text and we want to animate it, we usually make a pseudo element with a, with a, uh, a one pixel height. So we just use a pixel for that. Uh, very, very small things like that is where we use pixels. And then we use M's when we want to scale things. Uh, so rems pull their value from the root element, which is the HTML element. M's pull their value for M from their parent. So whatever the parent font size uh, is, whatever it's declared at, then those M values will pull from that for theirs. And you'll see that in, uh, let, me, let me reduce this. I'm going to show you this stitch right here. This is built with M's, and I'll show you why. So let's go ahead and reduce this. When we grow this, uh, when we grow the screen size, watch it grow as well. It grows with the screen size. It's, it's completely responsive, but we didn't have to make a unique media query for every screen size to make this work. What we did was we, uh, let's, let's go into here and I'll show you the code. So on the image group, this is the parent container for the images. Uh, and let's go to our HTML. Let's collapse the hero. We don't need that right now. Get out of here. Services, we're not working in that. So here we go. This is the image group. Uh, and this is the, the, the pictures that we have here. So we set all of their widths and heights to their final desktop positions and widths and heights, everything, the border radius. Literally, like the, the left, the border radius, the height, the width, everything is in M's in their final desktop value and position. And then on the parent, we set the font size to be a min-max uh, expression, where the minimum value will be 1.161 view width units. So now the font size is tied to the size of the view width, which is your screen. So when the screen size changes, that means that font size will increase with it. So if the screen gets bigger, uh, the value of 1.161 view width gets bigger. So that means all of these grow proportionally with it. And it will stop at 0.61M, which is like 61% of 1M. So normally you want this to stop at 1M, which is its final value. But I want this to stop smaller, which is what you see here. It stops here instead of growing because I want it to stay the same width uh, for this, this screen size. That was a decision I made to stop growing at 61% of its final size. And then uh, at desktop, we reset it. Let's scroll down, get this. I think in small desktop, we reset it right here. So at 64 rem, which is 1024 pixels, we reset it to be 0.8 view width units and stop growing at 1M. So this is the last one. So that when we grow it here, at 1024 pixels, you're gonna notice that it will get bigger. And right there. So now this is 0.8 view width units wide. And as the screen gets bigger, so does that value and it grows with it and it will stop at 1M, which is that, that final size. So that's why we use M's, so that we can scale these things up and down. These, are, these image groups are a great example of when to use it. You don't want to do this font scaling with view with units uh, on text elements because it's not accessible. 
it prevents the zoom from happening on those on those text elements because now their font size is a view width unit. Uh, so I only use this for image groups that we want to maintain their shape from mobile to desktop. We just build it the size that it's supposed to be on desktop, and then we use the font size min max to shrink it and tie it to the view width and grow with it and stop when we want it to stop. So that is why that that's why you see this. That's why we use M's inside of these things. Why everything in here is a rem. You'll notice that. However, all of these are in M's. And that's that's why we have that. And that's what that font size min max of whatever view width unit in one M is. You'll see this right here in a lot of places. And that's what's happening is we're we're using this to scale that section from mobile up to desktop and stopping at 1M eventually. Uh, but here we made it stop earlier. Uh, so that's what those are. Uh, and you'll notice another property that we use a lot is clamp. And that is how we can keep all of our styles in mobile. Like right here on mobile, we want the buttons to be a little smaller. So we set them to be 46 pixels tall, which is 2.875 rem. Uh, and we want them to end at 56 pixels tall, which is 3.5 rem. So on desktop, uh, this will be 56 pixels. On mobile, this will be 46. What we're doing here is we're setting the minimum, which is 46 pixels. I use rems. And then we set the growth rate in view width units. So I want you to grow at a rate of 5.5 times the view width unit, uh, or 5.5 view width units. And I want you to stop at 56 pixels or 3.5 rem. So if the value of 5.5 view width is less than 46 pixels, then it will stay 46 pixels. Once this is greater than 46 pixels, now this will be tied to the view width and it will grow with the view width. So if, this, if uh, the value of uh, the view width unit was 48 pixels, now this line height will be 48 pixels. Uh, but once we get to desktop, it will grow and grow steadily until it stops at 56. And that's how the clamp works. And we use this everywhere. So this is how we keep all the styles in, in mobile, because we can set the mobile code that we want, how fast or how slow we want it to grow, and where we want it to end, so that we don't have to go back and forth from our desktop and mobile media queries to make edits. We just go to the one spot in the mobile, and we do it. That's it. Uh, and that is essentially our code in a nutshell uh, and, and why we do things the way we do them. I just wanted to make this video just to go over our, uh, our thinking process, our methodology and philosophies behind the way we wrote our code and why. Uh, and you'll also, you'll also get more information in the, uh, in, in the video for, uh, I think it's called the, the Code Stitch Overview, where we talk about what to do after you paste a stitch into your website. I'll also link to that video in this description because uh, there's a few things you need to do when you paste a stitch into your site because of the way we coded it to make it easier to use uh, across all the stitches in your site. But uh, I'm going to keep this video short for now. I just wanted to go over those, those, uh, those reasonings for why our code looks the way it looks and basically how it works and why. Because uh, I know it is a little unconventional the way we do things, but it's also the reason why this works. Uh, so I hope this video was informative. I hope you like Code Stitch, and thanks for watching.